Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Everybody got their whiskey? <laughs> I'm totally kidding. I'm, I'm totally, totally kidding. Uh, yeah, I know. It's early for you guys. Uh, but I wanted to knock this out before I went and got started with the rest of my day. Uh, I appreciate everybody being here. Those of you who are awake and, and, and here for this uh, means a lot to me. Um, so I haven't really been talking uh, a whole lot about uh, this uh, Idaho, these Idaho slayings and um, the Brian Koberger situation. Um, now, a lot of the reason why I haven't been doing that is because there has been a lot of uh, stuff regarding gossip uh, that I'm just simply not interested in. But uh, there's this gentleman uh, named Howard Blum who has uh, been writing articles uh, and an ongoing uh, article that is in parts. Uh, now, the first article, uh, part one, uh, Thank you, Ultra Dark CEO, for the uh, super chat. I appreciate it. Uh, and I saw your message earlier. I don't know what's going on with that. Um, I don't really have any control over what YouTube's doing. Um, hi, Panda. 
Sorry. <laughs> Had a guest. Um, oh, yeah. I love the Misfits reference. Yes. Um, the first article was mostly focused on the actual crime itself, part one. And um, it's not that's not something that I like to really go over too much on my channel. There's a lot of really good channels that do that sort of thing for me. Um, I rather focus on the investigations. Uh, I'd rather focus on, uh, the case itself as far as the investigations, as I said, and as well as, um, how these things are dealt with, uh, when they move on, if they move, when and if they move on to trial. Um, this part is definitely more focused on the apprehension and uh, the case against Brian Koberger. Uh, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and read that. Um, and uh, and I do not have a view on the attorney. Uh, again, you know, my opinion on that, this is another reason why I haven't really been talking about that. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Mike M., uh, when it comes to the this whole thing with the attorney, trust me, I've been following it. Uh, but when it comes to this uh, this this defender uh, and uh, apparently Zana's mom had gotten into some trouble, um, I personally won't focus on that. And I'm not trashing anybody who talks about that sort of thing. I just personally don't feel how it's really relevant to the case and the investigation itself so much uh you know the I, I i my whole thing is i just don't like to focus on what's going on with xana's mom in the sense that you know if she has a criminal record i know that her criminal record has absolutely nothing to do with the crime itself uh whether or not she has a criminal record whether or not she's guilty of any things that we don't approve of uh, you know, uh, <laughs> and, and we're quick to judge people on and that's fine, whatever. Um, I don't have, I, I, I don't see it as being productive, uh, as far as information regarding the case so much, because, uh, in my eyes, she is still the mother of a victim, um, whatever she did and whatever crime she's committed and whatever, uh, uh, whatever mistakes that she's made, um, whatever decisions and choices that she's made, whatever path she's gone down does not have anything to do, uh, with the fact that she has lost, uh, a child and, uh, and I, I don't want to cloud that uh at least not on my platform again there's a lot of other channels that talk about that stuff because there's a demand for it people want to know and i get that it's juicy it's dirty blah 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 uh it, it's just not for me um but uh at the end of the day like i said and scarlet summer agrees with me she is still xana's mom and she lost somebody uh i don't know how many of you are parents uh, but me, myself, uh, as a parent, uh, not a perfect parent uh, by any means, and um, somebody who uh, also can't even begin to imagine uh, losing a child in the way that any of these parents have lost their children. Uh, so I, I, I just won't, um, I won't focus much on that. Uh, if it comes up, uh, in any way, shape, or form, if it comes up uh, while talking about it in some way, shape, or form, that's one thing. Uh, but for me, I, I just refuse to put a lot of focus on that and do anything that even remotely resembles throwing shame at one of these victims' parents uh, or family members or loved ones, for that matter. So uh, that's just my position on that. Again, I'm not trying to throw shade at any other creators that focus on that sort of thing, and that's fine. Um, it's just not my, it's not something I'm interested in personally. Um, so 
how are people already arguing in chat? Like, seriously, you know, uh, first of all, it's too early. I don't even know how anybody even has the patience to even <laughs> to even engage and hold down an argument, much less type it. Like, relax, people. Um, so I have this here article and um and I'm gonna go over it. And uh as you can see, I have it all right here. I'm just going to go ahead and read it to you guys. Uh, and this is how we're going to spend our Saturday morning together. And I hope that you find it uh, insightful and even uh, to some degree entertaining. Um, so. Now this uh, this came out uh, today, uh, and uh, it's it's brand new, hot off the presses, um, and it begins uh, saying uh, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. That's uh, useless, uh, basic geometry. Only you're smarter. It's easy. After all, you know how the investigators work. You're a student of cop think. So you stay one step ahead of them. No straight lines. You program a route into your phone that they wouldn't expect. It'll take a bit longer, but it'll still get you where you want to go. Sure, it took you up a week ago when the authorities announced they were looking for a white Honda Elantra. You'd be sloppy. Who'd have thought you'd get caught on a surveillance camera in a one-horse town like Moscow, Idaho. But you were already one step ahead of them. So what if they had a photo of a Hyundai with a single Pennsylvania plate? That's not you anymore. You'd quickly registered the car in Washington and attached a new set of plates. Presto. That's why you've gotten away with it for six weeks. And you'll keep on getting away with it because you're smarter than they are. Even better, you're lucky. You have the perfect cover. Your father along for the trip. Riding shotgun. What could be more innocent? All you need to do is keep driving. You'll be home for the holidays. 2,500 miles. Nearly the width of the entire country between you and those Keystone cops. Sell the car back east and they'll never know. You'll have the last laugh again. Killing is easy. And so is getting away with it. Doubtless, these are only speculations. The hard facts, especially for a case that was held, that has held the nation's attention for the past three months like a magnet, are frustratingly narrow. Brian Koberger, a 28-year-old doctoral candidate in the Criminal Justice and Criminology Department at Washington State University, has been charged with four counts of first-degree murder and one count of felony burglary as the lone assailant in the November 13th stabbing deaths of four University of Idaho students, Madison Mogan, Kaylee Consalves, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin. And since Koberger last week purpose, purposefully waived his right to a speedy preliminary hearing, preparation trumped timeless, his attorneys explained. It will not be until late in June, another five long and vexing months before the Idaho prosecutors at last divulge all the incriminating cards they have tucked up under their sleeves. <clears throat> now, I can't really, I want to be clear before I move on, uh, I can't really see chat very well. Uh, I'll come back and check it here and there. Um, but uh, if I miss anything important, I do apologize. Uh but uh, I'll be reading this article and uh, trying to keep it moving along as best as I can. <clears throat> Over the course of what is expected to be a last, uh, or sorry, at least four hard charging and, effective, or, and affecting days, prosecutors will strive to convince the judge 
that they have accumulated sufficient, sufficient evidence to, to proceed to trial. And the defense, acting on their client's wishes, will reveal whether it, it intends to fight with allegations with all its legal might, or if it will surrender Koberger to the presumed mercy of the court and have him plead guilty. The outcome of this decision is likely a matter, literally, of life or death. Idaho has established an execution chamber, quote unquote, where the lives of the judicially condemned are ended with a, with a catheterized drip of four solution lethal cocktail, of a four solution lethal, lethal cocktail. Yet regardless of what is determined at that still distant preliminary hearing, it seems self-evident that the next stage of Brian Koberger's complicated life, a pained existence lived by his own admission under a treacherous star was set in motion by the road trip that took him across America and home to the Pocono Mountains for the Christmas holidays. A journey that ultimately brought him to his present forlorn destination, a cell in the Lataw County, Idaho jail where he is being held without bail. And with equal certainty, it could be that Koberger made his way back home, then celebrated the in the of his family on the small army of officers who this purpose since it's un began things had clarified. They knew, as any pack of bloodhounds would know, that they had the scent. And although they dared not breathe a word to the media, or for that matter, even to their weary loved ones, they were closing in. Michael Koberger was worried about the snow. Only days earlier, he had flown from Philadelphia to Seattle, then caught a twin engine Embracer 170 jet for the one hour or so shuttle flight into the frigid Pullman Moscow Regional Airport. And now, December 13th, he is already heading back home. Only this time, it'd be a road trip. <clears throat> it was a fatiguing back and forth cross country jaunt, especially for a 67 year old. But Koberger had promised his son, Brian, who had nearly a month off before classes resumed at Washington State University, that he'd accompanied him on the drive back home for the Christmas break. And he was determined to make good on his pledge. Over the years, there had been some rough combative times between the two of them. He'd even had to get Brian into rehab to kick his teenage heroin habit. But now the young man seemed on a good path studying for a PhD in criminal justice offered a promising career trajectory for Brian. And it can be imagined. It must have puffed up a father with a prideful sense of parenting accomplishment. After all, Michael's own life had been tarnished by one by not one but two embarrassing bankruptcies and his work days were a drudgery spent as a maintenance man at the dreary high school his three children had attended. Perhaps he was even looking forward to this road trip as a way to revitalize his relationship with his son, a way to bury once and for all any lingering remnants, remnants of their old antagonisms. But now Michael, as he'd later recount to an associate, was largely focused only on the forecast. When it snowed in the Northwest, the, the accumulations were routinely measured in feet, not inches. Michael knew, and so he wanted to get going. When the weather came in, it'd be rough traveling a seven-year-old Hyundai Elantra without four-wheel drive. You'd be slipping and sliding all over the road. So he urged Brian that they should pack up and get going now. His son agreed. Only once they were on the road, Brian did something. His father would later casually share with one of the mechanics at the garage near their home in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania, who'd serviced the car after the trip that had caught him by surprise. Before Michael had headed out to Washington, he'd Googled the route back home. The quickest, most logical drive was pretty much a straight line plowing across the country along I-90. Brian, however, button hooks south toward Colorado where he'd pick, where he'd pick up I-70. He seemed to make little sense. Colorado in mid-December was snow country, 
there was no telling what might suddenly come blowing down from the Rockies. But Brian, according to what his father told people, insisted the northern, the northern route across I-90 promised wintry conditions. Better to head away from the weather, even if it added hours or even a day to the trip. It was, it was a strategy that, when explained that reasonable way, was practical, even prudent. But it seemed like something more devious to the FBI. Unknown to either the father or the son, the Bureau had been determined to keep a watchful eye on the white Elantre's trek across America. Only sources in law enforcement would confide with a bristle of entertainment, uh, entertainment of embarrassment, <laughs> excuse me, not long after the car had pulled out of its space in the graduate housing parking lot fronting 1630 Northeast Valley Road in Pullman, Washington, they lost it for several alarming hours or more. The authorities are keeping the precise details of this screw up close to the vest. The chief suspect in the quadruple homicide that had shocked the nation had seemingly valid, vanished. The Bureau's watchers called it a heart or, or a hate box, <clears throat> excuse me, a hat box operation. And the jargon was a bit of uh, anarchism. It was thrown back to an era where G-men sporting fedoras over their br <laughs> brile creamed hair would be out of force on the street to monitor a target's every move. A sea of hats would be box, uh, a, a sea of hats would box the suspect in. These days, the watchers have a few more tricks in their disposal. Undercover vehicles, surveillance vans, low-flying wing fixed winged planes, and that's just for starters. But the name is stuck, and the surveillance of Brian Koberger, according to published reports and interviews with officials, was hat box all the way. Now this... I apologize, but there is something obstructing this. And it's not even giving me an option to look into it. So, you know what I'm going to do here? Uh, I'm going to have to read a smaller print, but... Give me just one second, guys, for me to get everything together here. Okay, now still. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's something obstructing some of this. Uh, unfortunately, I'm just going to have to skip through some of it because uh, there is absolutely no option for me to remove this obstruction uh, the downloaded or the online version. So <laughs> I apologize, guys. Um, <clears throat> and I'm trying to find a way to read this to where it does not, where we don't miss anything too much. Uh, I'm just going to skip through it. So later in the still morning, still new morning, the morsel of intelligence, interesting, but certainly nothing provocative, was passed on to the Corporal Brett Payne, the gung-ho former Army MP who was the M Moscow police's lead investigator. Payne dutifully typed <coughs> the car's registration de details into the motor vehicle's record system, and the screen quickly displayed a photograph of Brian Koberger as well as his state driver's license information. The license revealed that Koberger is a white male and a sturdy six feet and 185 pounds, but it was the photograph that held Payne's studious gaze. He swiftly zeroed in on the eyebrows. They were bushy. And that Payne realized with the mounting sense of triumph was precisely the sort of telltale clue he'd been pray praying for over the past two weeks. For all along since the very first days of this grim case, he and the small inner circle of investigators had been guarding an explosive secret. They had an eyewitness, Dylan Mortensen, 
one of the two 19-year-old surviving roommates, had seen the killer. At a little past 4 a.m., just about when the, when the detectives theorized the four students had been hacked to death, she'd heard a, pla uh, a, plaint a, a plaintive cry, anxious. She opened the door to her second floor room and saw someone, a man dressed ominously in black, was walking towards her. He was, she'd vividly recall, the details forever etched deep into her memory, at least five feet ten, not bulked up, but still trim like an athlete, and he wore a mask that covered his mouth and nose, but not his eyes or his eyebrows. A profound and venement fear seized hold of her. A frozen shock phase was how she would try to describe her galloping emotions. But the black-clad intruder continued past her as if she were invisible and headed towards a sliding glass door that led out of the house. For reasons that continue to be bound right with the bands of mystery, Dylan returned to her room, locked the door, and didn't emerge until after 11 a.m. Only then did she summon friends who, in a state of full-blown panic, at last called 911. But as she later related her unnerving experience to police interrogators, she shared one detail that at the time seemed small, if not irrelevant. The man in black had bushy eyebrows. And now, 16 long days after the murders, Brett Payne found himself staring at a photograph of a man who might, just might, be the intruder Dylan had seen walking purposefully through her home. In the hectic days that followed, the investigators quick, quietly went to work on Koberger using cell phone data. The techies on FBI's cellular analysis survey team mapped his movements. Koberger, uh, they methodically counted, had been in the King Road neighborhood near the murder site at least a dozen times over the past few months. Had he been stalking one of the victims, the residents? They wondered. And like Sherlock Holmes, whose uncanny deductions in the adventures and the adventure of Silver Blaze were prompted by the curious incident of the dog that didn't bark, they too found reassurance in a negative fact. The discovery that Koberger had apparently turned off his phone during the time when the murders occurred was further tantalizing, uh, tant was further tantalizing knowledge. But it was not enough. They also surly realized to persuade a judge to issue an arrest warrant. All they could do for now was store the intelligence away until another vital part of the puzzle could be unearthed. The crucial eureka moment that would allow them to tie all the desperate, all the dis disparate pieces into a firm knot, a knot that not even the most industrious defense attorney could even hope to unravel. In the meantime, though they would not need to keep a watch on Koberger, the entire country, or its, or it often seemed, was complaining that the case was dragging on and on without resolution. It would be a disaster, not just professionally, but also for the own peace, for their own peace of mind, because Moscow was, for many of them, a hometown too. If Koberger slipped out of their grasp before handcuffs could be firmly locked around his wrists. Only now, as the suspect headed across the country in the very car they believed had been captured in the blurry surveillance footage, his father mystifyingly at his side, they had lost him even before the hat box op could even get underway. A mood of, pan a mood of panic rip rip rapidly escalated into one of despair. Frantically, they began to search the records, automated license plate readers, uh, in nearby states, it was an exercise in futility. Nothing, not a single hit. Then they got lucky. There's not much to Loma, Colorado. There's just about 1,300 people scattered about a few big farmsteads, but U.S. Route 6 passes straight through the center of the town. And eight years ago, the Colorado Department of Transportation thought it was high time to install Loma's first traffic light. It went up in 2015 at the bustling, things being relative, of course, intersection of Route 6 
and Highway 139. It wasn't long after when the engineers decided that they might as well affix an ALPR to the light pole. And on December 13th, it caught Washington State Plate CFB 8708. The white 2015 Elantra registered to Brian Koberger. With this sighting, the hat box op was once again underway. The watchers would keep their eyes covertly on the car all the way to Pennsylvania. Fate had mercifully bestowed on them a second chance, and they were determined not to stumble. Still, they were not prepared for what happened next. I'm going to look over chat here real quick. And again, I do apologize um, for some of my delivery here. Uh, I am reading this with you. This is a reaction. Um, so, uh, so far, I'm pretty, uh, I'm, 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 I'm absolutely uh, invested in the way that this man is telling this story, uh, this Howard Blum. Uh, he's doing this in a very, very captivating manner. And, um, and, uh, oh, somebody send me a PayPal. I appreciate it. Thank you, Emily Flutia. Thank you so much. Um, but, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this, this Howard Blum is, is really, uh, painting a picture here that, uh, that has really got my attention. So, uh, it continues to say the interstate was a flat and empty as the landscape. Any threat of snow had vanished. The dome of sky above I-70 was reassuringly blue. In Michael Koberger's calm and steady universe, there was no reason to suspect that the FBI was lurking in the shadows. Even the suggestion of such clandestine goings-on would likely have struck him as, pre as preposterous. Nevertheless, as two days passed uneventfully and the pair now drove through Indiana early on the morning of December 15th, Michael suddenly found his world starting to tilt off its access. He abruptly had a new worry. It seemed incredibly that his son's stolen university neighborhood, the precise location, just a stone's throw, in fact, from Brian's apartment, had turned into a combat zone. The details were this. Brian had received and then apparently shared with his dad a pinging alert on his phone. At around 3.20 a.m., WSU had issued an emergency advisory. The community was advised to shelter in place. As the Koburgers would learn by listening to news reports, earlier that evening, a man menacingly waving a rifle had threatened to kill his roommates. When the police arrived, the frightened roommates were released, but the rifle-toting individual, Brent Kopaka, a 36-year-old Army veteran reportedly suffering from PTSD, barricaded himself in the apartment and made it clear he wasn't going to leave. With that defiant declaration, events escalated with a dangerous momentum. When the Whitman County Regional SWAT team approached the apartment, the gunmen opened fire. The police shot back. The tree-lined streets were suddenly cracking with gunfire. Crisis negotiators' pleas were answered with bullets. <clears throat> and with the first light of the new day blooming, the seven-hour standoff surged to its harsh conclusion. A steely SWAT team sergeant shot Kopaka dead. The incident seemed, if its subsequent nonplussed conversations were any indication to unnerve Michael, he had sent his son off to study for his PhD, not to get entrapped in horrifying events. Yet did the lethal shooting, the spectacle of bullets carrying through his son's neighborhood prompt the concerned father to discuss with his son the brutal murders of the four students just weeks earlier in a house, a mere 15 minute drive from Brian's apartment. It is it is difficult to imagine that it did not. Raking over the gruesome Idaho case had in many quarters become a macabre pastime. Uh, would not an anxious father make the leap from one calamity to another nearby? One also tied to a university. After all, they were seated nearly shoulder to shoulder 
in the narrow confines of the of the Hyundai for three mon monotonous days. They had to have they had to have found something to talk about on the long drive. Tedium is an effective catalyst, and the touchstones were limited. Is it a reckless? supposition to suggest that Idaho student murders were the stuff of a substantive father and son chat? The answers of these questions, however, are known only to two people, to be revealed, if ever, on their own volition. Nevertheless, it does not take elaborate flights of the imagination to envision a trenchant of guarded conversation centered on the infamous local tragedy, or for that matter, to wonder about the demons that, if the authorities' allegations have merit, might have come to perilously close to bursting forth. Yet while there are no recordings of the, of the road trip chats, what happened as the Hyundai crept through Hancock County, Indiana, has been carefully preserved. At 1041 on the morning of December 15th, as the car approached the 107 mile marker on the interstate, Brian Koberger saw red and blue lights flashing in his rearview mirror. A sheriff's car was demanding that the vehicle pull over. Brian obeyed. He waited behind the wheel as the officer approached. <clears throat> what would happen next seemed destined to play out as a high drama. At the very least, the car approximately fit the description of a vehicle observed in the aftermath of a quadruple murder. The driver, the Moscow Police Department had alerted the nation, was to be considered a person of interest in their investigation. As Deputy Nick Ernst, Ernstess, Ernst, or I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, I apologize, walked with slow measured steps toward the passenger side of the Hyundai where Michael sat, there seemed to be no escape. There would be no springing free. The time of reckoning had arrived. Only as the tape from Ernstess's er, 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 body cam revealed the ensuing confrontation was all denouement, more farce than tragedy. <clears throat> the conversation between the Kobergers and the deputy moved forward with its own abstruse logic, a litany of non sequiturs that seemed as if it'd been inspired by a madcap Abbott and Costello routine. When the deputy officially, uh, officiously demands where they are heading, Brian's response suggests nothing more than a casual drive. We're going to get some Thai food right now. That's when the father decides it's his turn to play the straight man. Well, we're coming from WSU. To the Indiana deputy, the uh, initials have no meaning. It's all beyond him. So both the father and son, eager to please, attempt to remedy the confusion and in the, pro and in the process only add to the officer's puzzlement. He can't decide whether both of them work at the university or who, in fact, is the student or if they've headed out to Washington State on a cross-country road trip to get Thai food in Pennsylvania. Then, even as the deputy is laboriously trying to sort through this befuddling torrent of information, Michael, who seems as if he could talk the ears off of a brass monkey, starts rambling on about the shooting earlier that day at WSU. This grabs the officer's attention. So what do you say about some SWAT teams? Michael now has his lead. He begins a long-winded explanation only to be cut off uh, interesting, the, de the deputy remarks with apparent interest, but Michael is determined to have the last word. Well, it's horrifying, he reprimands, yet the son must have his say so too. Uh, with a graduate student's well ingrained reverence for the facts, he corrects, We don't know about that actually, we weren't there for the shooting. <laughs> we're slightly punchy because we've been driving for hours the father finally confesses but now the poor deputy is no doubt punchy too and in the end perhaps eager to escape from the madness he warns them not to tailgate and lets them go without a ticket 
after the body cam footage ends, it is difficult to discern who is happier to be driving off, the Coburgers or the deputy. Yet a quick nine minutes after they're back on the interstate, Brian once again sees flashing lights in his rearview mirror. The Coburgers are stopped again. This time, it is the state trooper who pulls them over. Once more, at the very least, their car should create a shock of recognition. After the nationwide Moscow police uh, vehicle alert, it's a, tick, it's a ticking bomb. Only against all odds, they're again simply reprimanded for tailgating and then sent on their way without a ticket. Yet, unbeknownst to either the father or the son, it will be only a matter of time before they lock runs, uh, uh, excuse me, before their luck runs out. And while Michael's previous worries didn't come to fruition, this one will. And what were the FBI thinking as they, from a discreet distance, observed their targets being pulled over, not once, but mind-bogglingly twice by the authorities? This is an iron rule law enforcement veterans will tell you that in any long-running op, the unexpected is to be expected at any time. The outrageous, in fact, must be regarded as inevitable. Yet, according to sources familiar with the Bureau's skittish temperament, as these two unanticipated traffic stops played out, a knowing patience was not the guiding standard that December day, the, the agents were frustrated and they were angry. The possibilities were too dangerous. The main problem shared law enforcement officials with the arm's length familiarity with the FBI surveillance operation was the watcher's helpless passivity. Um, I find that really interesting. I'm going to pause there for a second. Um, I find that really interesting because I had the theory that these law enforcement agents, these, these, the, these cops that pulled uh, Brian over, Brian and Michael over for routine traffic stops, um, I, I theorized and, and kind of played with the idea that they had to know they were part of the investigation and they were somehow, I guess, maybe uh, accumulating uh, body cam footage maybe to, to possibly uh, build their case, maybe get them to say something incriminating, who knows. But I found it hard to believe that these two cops were not aware of this car. And because obviously it's, as the article says, how, how do these cops not know that this is, that this is this person of interest, that this car is a car of interest in this investigation. Now, everybody's looking for this car. So I was sitting here thinking, well, I mean, well, yeah, how could they know? How could they not know that? <laughs> um, so I was just kind of shocked at that. Um, now that I'm reading this, you know, the FBI apparently, because I, I, from what I understand, this Howard Blum uh, has sources inside law enforcement that are very close to this investigation and providing him with accounts. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, according to this article and according to this perspective, uh, the FBI saw this as a big monkey wrench in the situation, but they're already trained to expect the unexpected and even things that seem to be inconvenient, you have to consider them to be basically inevitable. They're going to happen. Uh, so they're trained to just expect the worst possible monkey wrenches in their investigations to get thrown in there. Um, so it makes sense. Um, but I, it's, it's very fascinating to me to hear that they, these, 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 Traffic officers had no idea. Uh, they weren't suspicious at all. Uh, it goes on to say, all they could do was observe. Oh, I lost my place there. Sorry about that. Oh, man. Uh, 
you click on one thing and then the whole thing just starts over. Sorry about that, guys. Give me just one second and I will find my place, I promise. Wow, I hadn't even realized I read this much of it. Um, <laughs> All they could do was observe from a distance and wonder. Had diligent Indiana lawmen spotted the car traveling down the interstate and immediately connected it to the white Hyundai that was wanted by the Moscow PD? Were the locals about to make an arrest before the final incriminating piece had been fitted into the puzzle? If that happened, it had the potential to be a catastrophe. The suspect would be alerted, and perhaps then, if he was advised by a canny lawyer, the army of investigators would never have the opportunity to make the airtight case. The second concern, however, was an even more dangerous prospect. Was the suspect armed? Would someone who they believed had killed four people hesitate to kill again? Would the highway cops become victims too? Or would the suspect simply gun the, uh, the Hyundai and race down the highway? The spectacle of another OJ-like chase might be imminent. In the end, none of the apprehensive watchers' anxieties came to fruition. But a hard lesson, according to what other law enforcement officials heard, had been learned. This case had to be wrapped up soon. If not, anything could happen. There were too many imponderables. Time was not on their side. And what about Brian Koberger, a man who has resolutely professed his innocence? What emotions rushed through him as he saw the flashing lights in his rearview mirror? The judge, by his demeanor on the two body cam videos, he displayed a remarkable calm. He seemed unruffled by the sort of highway encounter that would have left many people jumpy, even if they would never subsequently be charged with four counts of homicide. Highway cops routinely wield their authority as a bludgeon. It's their first line of defense. Koberger's emotional temperature, however, didn't appear to jump a notch. This is indeed one side of Brian Koberger, discipline and control as his courtroom appearances reveal, can rule. But there is also, by his own admission, and in his own words, another side to him, one that is dark, detached, and steeped deep in misery. Unhappiness and alienation can often dominate his mood, says Koberger, writing as a desperate teenager on the website, Tap, tap a Talk. There are the raw, bedeviling forces that drove him he explains to contemplate suicide. There are the painful demons he wails to a friend that drove him to search for a sort of relief by mainlining heroin. And at the root of all his swirling emotions, he diagnoses in the online postings with an unwavering certainty, certainty is visual snow. Visual snow is a rare but very real and chronic neuro neurological condition. To those who suffer from it, the world is viewed through a glass darkly. It's like looking at a television screen and the pictures fluttering, the images obscured by amorphous grayish waves and scattered flickering dots. But is it a disease or is it a psychological condition? Doctors, according to the, spare, to the sparse literature, throw up their hands in frustrated confusion. They just don't know. And what can be diagnosed is even more difficult to treat. But for the teenage Brian Koberger, if his online posts are any reliable guide, Visual Snow had at times had at times buried his existence in an avalanche of despondency and desperation. His posts were calls from the wild. Consider, I often think of myself as an organic sack of meat with no self-worth. I am starting to view everyone as, as this. I also feel as if I am not there, completely depersonalized, constant thought of suicide, crazy thoughts, delusions of grandeur, 
poor self-image, no emotion. I feel like nothing has a point to it. Everyone hates me. Pretty much, I'm an asshole. As I hung my family, I see, as I hug my family, sorry, I see nothing. It is like I'm looking at a video game, but less. In the posts, he's suburban incarn he's a suburban incarnation of Camus's Meseralt. Only Coburgers at sea in the Poconos rather than Algeria. Yet it is a mindset that just as Meseralt discovered is empowering. Coburger decides he can do whatever I want with little remorse. And oh, the bristling anger. According to the internet sleuths who have traced his teenage email to a posting on SoundCloud 11 years ago, Koberger's defiant moods took flight in a howling rap song. <laughs> Sorry, I think of that rap song and I laugh. <laughs> you are not my equal. You are evil, but I'm devil, he challenges. Of course, these posts are lyrics... Um, sorry, of course, these posts and lyrics are the work of a teenager. More than a decade has flown by since they were written. It was time enough for Koberger to find the will to kick heroin, the discipline to graduate from college, and the ambition to enroll in a PhD program. Nevertheless, perhaps the anguished posts and the ferocious song are also a warning. Out of words come events. The future cannot exist without having been envisioned in the past. And one more puzzlement in this case must be confronted. Are these teenage thought dreams the intimidations? I'm sorry, the intimations of an adult future? For the hunters, meanwhile... It was time for preparation. And as a result, in the antsy days following the Koberger's arrival at last in the Poconos on the afternoon of December 16th, the Moscow police suffered through variable moods. There were bursts when there was no denying that great push forward was underway. Corporal Brett Payne, the PD's lead investigator, obtained a search warrant and then a day later, on December 23rd, he received the records of Koberger's cell phone for 24 hours before and after the homicides. With the help of the FBI, this information was employed to plot a map that intensified suspicions. After cell phone towers near the King Road house lost all track of Koberger's phone at about 3 a.m., was it shut off? Left at another location? His phone suddenly jumped back to life in the wee hours of the morning, not long after the murders, and his car was tracked heading south from Moscow at just after 9 a.m. Nearly two hours before the police were summoned, he was tracked to the neighborhood of the killings. The murderer returning to gaze at the scene of the crime? Payne could only wager a guess. But according to now confident buzz going through the PD, this was, this was a bet he'd take. On the other hand, it was also a time of disappointment. Just as the case was nearing the finish line, cops in Moscow moaned. They had no choice but to hand it over to the Pennsylvania State Police. Koberger was now in the state's playing field. They'd be the ones who'd take the ball over the goal line. Major Chris Paris had been handpicked by the FBI to run the op for the Stadies. And he was, he was a shrewd choice. He looked like a linebacker, and he did have a, a gruff, uh, a no-nonsense edge. But he was also a thoughtful, scholarly man. He'd graduated magna, come loud, from the University of Scranton, and he went on to get a law degree from Temple. And perhaps most valuable given the circumstances, Paris possessed a lawyerly sense of discretion. He shared the secret that a suspect was in the crosshairs with just an eight-person working group. A leak, a promiscuous whisper, and the whole case just might be blown.
Sorry, I'm looking at chat. Cherry, shut up. Stop it. <laughs> All right. Like I said, I'm just looking at some of your comments, guys. Yeah, some of you guys are familiar with this, Mr. Blum. Yeah, um, this is really fan uh, fascinating because some of you guys are 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 theorizing as to why uh, he took heroin and 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 things of that nature. And, you know, uh, we're never really going to understand why, you know, um, I don't even think, I mean, I think there could be some sound theories from people who are, uh, you know, mental health professionals or have some training in mental health. But, um, but, you know, unless you can actually sit down with this guy uh, for an extended period of time uh, and, you know, several times, uh I still think that's only peeling maybe the first layer of, of, of an onion, like, like a guy like this. Uh, it's really, really strange. Uh, somebody who could come to these kind of decisions uh, and, and, and just brutally murder somebody the way that he did uh, for people for that matter. Very, very strange. Uh, but I don't think, I mean, I think that the reason why people are so fascinated with this case uh, is not now so much just the fact that four young people were murdered. And because we went from being worried about. Are they going to catch this guy? And how do they even go about catching this guy? This guy walked out and, and seemed to come in and out without a trace. Uh, and the fact that somebody like this could be living among us. And then the interest shifts into once they catch him the interest shifts into uh trying to understand what his motive was and so far this is what makes it so fascinating there's been no apparent motive so far uh the the motive seems to be as elusive as as no motive uh seems to be synonymous with with absolutely possibly no motive uh this is a guy who just wanted to kill uh and studied criminal law to try to understand how to get away with these things uh that seems to be the most sound theory the most plausible theory that's floating around right now um which is insane uh it's a very very scary thought i i you know being a a, a hardcore batman fan and i know some of you guys are thinking like oh god batman really will um, the fact is, is, uh, like if you, if you take the time to read Batman graphic novels, they're really interesting detective stories. A lot of them, um, the latest movie is very much that they really, really kind of focus on that vibe that Batman graphic novels did. Um, and, and, and the dark Knight, uh, the one with, uh, Heath Ledger playing the Joker. Um, this really reminds me of that, uh, in the sense that, that they kind of tried to do that a little bit there. Um, and they really focused on the, the evil that the Joker in that movie really was. And uh, there's a scene where, where Alfred Michael Caine uh, is, is showing his wisdom in comparison to uh, Batman's genius and, and, and detective skills and where his wisdom just trumps uh uh, Bruce Wayne's uh, genius uh, and education. Uh, and he basically just, he tells the story about how uh, when he was serving in the military, they were in uh, somewhere in Africa, I believe. And uh, there was this bandit that would go around and steal things just for the sake of just stealing them. Nobody could catch him. Nobody could figure out because they couldn't figure out his motive. They couldn't figure out 
you know, the trying to catch this guy who's stealing these jewels. Um, they're they're tracking down fences. They're tracking down anywhere that he might try to sell them, and they just couldn't catch this guy. And then apparently they found a child playing with a ruby the size of a fist or something like that, uh, or the size of a tangerine is how he describes it. And and then it, it turns out that he was just doing it for sport. And he compares this bandit to the Joker, and the Joker being basically this person who doesn't have any motive at all whatsoever, doesn't do the things that he does for any financial gain, nothing, just likes, he just, as he puts it in the movie, he just wants to see, some men just want to see the world burn. Uh, and I don't think it's responsible to underestimate Brian Koberger in any way, shape, or form uh, and, and assume that he's not capable of feeling the same way in some way, shape, or form. Uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's naive uh, at this point to think about Brian Koberger uh, as being capable of any less than someone who just wanted to kill for the thrill of killing. And actually these feelings consumed him to the point to where he actually studied criminology to get so good at it to where he can continue to do it and get away with it and be one step ahead of law enforcement and understand their tactics and how they would actually try to catch a guy like him. Um, I think it would be naive to not uh, look at him as being very capable of being someone of this um, capable of this extreme way of thinking with absolutely nothing to gain other than the sheer thrill of killing and getting away with it. For although Koberger was apparently unaware of it at the time, the Stades and the suspect were playing an intricate game of cat and mouse. There was Koberger observed taking his Hyundai in for servicing at a garage in Effort, Pennsylvania, not far from his parents' home. Next, he's spotted wearing gloves as he gives the vehicle a, a, a meticulous cleaning. And of course, <clears throat> there are actions that can mean nothing or everything. It just depends on the preconceived notions that influence your judgment. A little harder to miss, though, is Koberger sneaking over to the deposit, uh, sneaking over to deposit some trash in a neighbor's garbage pail at around 4 a.m. one morning. Getting rid of incriminating evidence or just a bit of mischief? Once again, evil is in the eye of the beholder. But all this was before the great trash robbery. That was what some wags at the troop, at Troop N, the state police barracks that was running the surveillance op, later dubbed the pilfering on December 27th. <clears throat> Sorry, on December 27th, Major Paris received a request from the FBI to plunder the trash bins outside the Coburger residence. That same day, once the Stadies were certain no one was looking, two troopers swooped in and made off with a pile of Coburger's family detrius. The purloined parcel was quickly shipped across the country to Meridian, uh, to Meridian, Idaho. There at the Idaho State Police Crime Lab on South Stratford Drive, a forensic team went to work sorting through the trash. It turned out to be a treasure trove. For all along, the Moscow police had, had been holding a tight to second secret. One that was no less charged with no less charged than the statement from the eyewitness. A knife sheath stamped with the U.S. Marine Corps Eagle Globe and anchor insignia had been found lying <clears throat> lying on the bed next to the next to Madison Mog Mogan's body. Sorry. Um, I'll read that one more time. For all along, the Moscow police had been holding on tight to a second secret, one that was no less charged than the statement from the eyewitness, 
a knife sheath stamped with the U.S. Marine Corps Eagle, Globe, and Anchor insignia had been found lying on the bed next to Madison Mogan's bloody, bloody corpse. And from the sheath's button snap, a speck of male DNA had been recovered. It was a minuscule sample, but it was all that was needed. When compared to Michael, Michael Koberger's DNA lifted from the garbage that had been uh, clandestinely carried off, cl clandestinely <laughs> carried off, uh, it proved nearly conclusively that Techies conf confidently rejoiced that it was his son's DNA on the knife sheath. The next day, December 29th, the triumphant Brett Payne sat down to finalize the arrest warrant for Brian Koberger. When he was done, he had no time to enjoy his moment of high achievement. Instead, full of tense urgency, an animating, an animating convic conviction that, e that every moment counted, he hand-delivered the 18-page document to the courthouse. Moments after Judge Megan Marshall signed off, a call was made to Pennsylvania. It's a go, Major Paris was told. Dynamic entry is only used to serve an arrest warrant when the threat matrix is code red. You go in with overwhelming force, pounding down the doors, breaking windows, and setting off explosive devices. The strategy is meant not just to surprise a subject, but also to scare the living daylights out of them. Because there's one thing that's always rising up in the mind of any tactical cop charging through the front door. If the target's waiting inside to ambush you, it doesn't matter too much what sort of tactics you use. This is his turf. He has the advantage. And if he's determined not to give up without a fight, bad things can happen. At just after midnight on December 30th, a Pennsylvania State Police Special emergency response team assembled at the gray barn like troop north barracks in hazelton pennsylvania there were about 24 of them the usual 16 entry team members and maybe eight sharpshooters and they were packing glock 40 caliber pistols were generally the weapon of choice and the point men as a rule carried two pistols those who'd be the first through the door were also armed with stubby black HK MP5 submachine guns. It was a brutal weapon, particularly in an enclosed space. The backups had short barrel Remington 870 12 gauges. It was a shotgun meant for killing, not wounding. And over military style camo uniforms, they wore heavy load bearing tactical body armor fitted out with level four strike plates. The early morning arrest of Brian Koberger would be a code red op, dynamic entry all the way. The SERT team piled into a couple of specifically outfitted Ford E350 extended body vans for the ride to Albrightsville. A contingent of Troop N, a Troop North <coughs> Stadies followed as backup. All in all, they were about 40 officers. It might as well have been an, an invading army. They were ready for a fight. But as the force approached the, pre the pretty community dotted with playgrounds and volleyball courts where the Koburgers lived, the lead van came to a sudden halt. The entrance to Indian Mountain Lake, the entrance to Indian Mountain Lakes was blocked by a pair of white boom gates. A code had to be entered into a sentry box for the gates to rise. And none of the heavily armed men had the code. At that frustrating moment, a few of the tough guy SER team members, according to the Amuse story that buzzed around the Troop North in the aftermath, wanted to just plow through. <laughs> uh, so picture this. So you just got, I mean, I just want to kind of elaborate on the picture that uh, that Blum is painting here. I find it really fascinating because basically you just got a shit ton of just gung-ho uh, heavy cops who just live for, I mean, and in that area, you don't imagine a SWAT team or, or any of these tactical officers. They probably hardly ever see any action at all whatsoever, unless they're asked for assistance uh, from an outside area, from an outside jurisdiction to come in and, and help. Uh, but they probably never see any action. 
and the type of guys that that sign up for this are probably action junkies. These guys that j- just fantasize and daydream about busting in and just tactfully taking out some piece of shit that is engaged in some sort of deplorable behavior that is, you know, a, a serial rapist to a human trafficker, to a massive drug dealer uh, and drug trafficker, um, you know, or a possible serial killer uh, or just a guy who's capable of murdering four people with a knife. Uh, and there seems to be no visible, no apparent motive behind the crime. So, which means that this guy is capable of anything and you do not underestimate him. So you strap up everything that you've got, every bit of tactical gear that you've got, all your tactical training comes into play. And these guys are, are pumped up (laughs) these guys are ready to go so you visualize these guys they got this whole plan mapped out and this stupid one little detail is stopping them where they don't have a code this is this is the kind of detail that makes a pizza delivery guy have a hard time at work a stupid detail like I can't even get into the code to be able to deliver this pizza. The, the customer's going to complain and then I'm not going to get a tip. Something that mundane is stopping these guys, these professionals, these hardcore badass guys where a lot of them probably have military training, probably combat veterans. And this is just what they do. This is how this is. This is not just what they do this is who they are tactical combat people you know what i mean like badasses to the gills badasses balls to bone and they get obstructed by a gate and they don't have the code (laughs) so naturally some of these guys are gonna be like dude let's just bust in through the fucking gate fuck this gate (laughs) <laughs> so i'm just visualizing this happening and i just find it really really fascinating and interesting um <laughs> so <laughs> so they're thinking about flooring the heavy vans uh and and just let them smash the damn boon gates to smithereens they insisted on it But cooler heads prevailed as they heavily as the heavily armed officers waited impatiently in the vans. A state trooper tracked down uh, an acquaintance in Indian uh, Mountain Lakes and the entry code was obtained with the gates at last raised high. The force to proceed. The force proceeded in the early morning darkness down a twisting road, passing one neat little house after another as it made its way to Lamsden Drive. It was so quiet, it seemed as if the cocking of a single rifle would rouse people from their slumber. But then all hell broke loose. A door flew off its hinges, windows shattered, explosive charges boomed. The SERT team stormed the stunned Koberger's white clapboard home. In the end, without a single shot being fired, Brian Koberger was let off in handcuffs. Jason Labar sat in his third floor office overlooking Main Street in downtown Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, waiting for it to get dark. He figured that give him he figured that give him the best shot of making his way to the Monroe County Jail without being followed by a pack of nosy reporters. Because since early that morning, December 30th, Labar, the chief public defender in the county, a lawyer whose family's deep roots in the area reached far back to colonial times, had awakened to the news that he would be the attorney of record for the most infamous prisoner in the nation. He'd be representing Brian Koberger in the hearing for his extradition to Idaho. Yet it had first seemed to the gleeful Pennsylvania authorities that a lawyer might be unnecessary. In the hours after the arrest, Koberger had genially agreed to talk to police. He said that, of course, He knew about the four murders in Idaho. Everyone in the area did. After all, he explained he lived only 10 miles 
from the murder house. And he kept on talking steadfastly, denying any involvement in the events for about 15 minutes. But as the eager interrogators grew, uh, as the eager interrogators' questions grew more pointed, Koberger said enough. He wanted a lawyer. Only he couldn't afford to pay for one. That was when the call went out to Labar. He was the logical choice. Not only was he the chief public defender, but in his decades of practice, he had appeared before courts in more than 20 capital cases. Wow. He knew the territory. And not least, he was a local guy, a street, uh, a, a star three letterman in his day at Bangor High School. Cherry, don't do it. Recently elected to the school's athletic high, uh, hall of fame. He could handle the, pres uh, the pressures that come with the, uh, that come with this sort of case. Still, when Labar got the call, his first reaction he'd say was surprise. Like everyone else, he'd been following the events in Idaho, but he never could have imagined the trail would lead across the country to his own backyard. But Friday was a half day at the office and instead of going home at noon, he closed the door and prepared for his first meeting with the crew with the new with the new client. He needed to check the Idaho extradition statutes, and he wanted to make sure that he went into the conference with a firm agenda. There was a lot that needed to be done, and there was no knowing how many how much time he'd have before the authorities hauled Koberger back to his cell. But first, Labar waited for it to be get waited for it to get dark. His strategy worked. On the short drive over, he kept checking his rearview mirror, but there was no one on his tail. And so it was just after 5 p.m. on an already pitch dark December evening when Labar finally sat across from Koberger. The, conver the conversation went on for about an hour, and afterward Labar was willing to share a bit of what had been discussed. He started in, the lawyer said, by making it clear to Koberger that he would be representing him just in the extradition hearing. Therefore, he didn't want he didn't want to hear any of the specific details about the case. He did, however, want to know if his client was willing to release a statement to the press. Koberger quickly agreed. In fact, he was adamant. He was determined to make sure people knew that he was eager to be exonerated. Koberger also insisted, as Labar reported, this is not me. He denied being the murderer or being any specific or being or or having any specific knowledge of the crime. Labar also released a statement from Koberger's family. <clears throat> the statement goes as follows. First and foremost, we care deeply for the four families who have lost their precious children. It read, We have fully cooperated with law enforcement agencies in an attempt to seek the truth and promote his presumption of innocence rather than judge unknown facts and make erroneous assumptions. The lawyer was struck by how calm and intelligent Koberger appeared. The gruesome crimes he had been charged with, the lawyer remarked with a clear sense of wonder, seemed a little out of character. And so the next day, in his formal statement to the press, Labar sternly lectured, Mr. Koberger has been accused of, a of very serious crimes, but the American justice system cloaks him in a veil of innocence. He should be presumed innocent until proven otherwise, not tried in the court of public opinion. Then within days, Labar was off the case. On January 4th, shackled, in a, shackled and in a red jumpsuit, Koberger was flown in, in, in a tiny fixed-wing single-engine Pilatus across the country. The plane landed at Moscow Pullman Regional Airport, <clears throat> the same airport where only about three weeks earlier, Michael Koberger had arrived in anticipation of a convenient road trip with his son. Bad facts is a phrase defense lawyers like to band about. It's a term that's meant to draw and epistemolo epistemo epistemological distinction between what is objectively real and what is subjective opinion. 
Just because the prosecutor says it's true, well, that doesn't make it so. <clears throat> and the bad facts riddling the probable cause affidavit that, that police used to obtain Koberger's arrest, as well as those in the laundry list of seemingly provocative items found in the search for Koberger's apartment, found in the search for Koberger's apartment in Washington, are indeed disturbing. <clears throat> Item the affidavits, the affidavit cites a shoe with a diamond-shaped pattern, similar to the pattern of, of a Vans-type shoe style, found at the scene of the crime. Well, well, does Koberger own a pair of Vans? And even if it's established that he does, there's a photo that shows at least one person in the house in King Road wearing a Vans, wearing Vans prior to the murders. That right there's some reasonable doubt. Uh, <clears throat> the cell phone tower data that links Koberger to the scene of the murders is more an approximation of his whereabouts than an exact location. And being in the vicinity is not at all the same as being at the scene of the crime. More damaging, the affidavit with a remarkable candor admits to some confusion in this sort of analysis. Investigators found that the 8545 uh, did not connect to a cell phone tower that provides service to uh, Moscow in November 14th, 2022, but investigators do not believe that the 8545 phone was in Moscow on that date. Huh? The prosecution is stating that the cell phone evidence is correct only some of the time. How's that going to fly with a jury? See, this is important, people. Uh, I'm going to pause here. But this is important. This is something that I'm always talking about on this channel, folks. Um, just a reminder, those of you who, who, those of you who are familiar with my channel and familiar with how I discuss these cases, uh, you guys understand where I'm coming from when I'm constantly saying this. Uh, and those of you who are new to the channel, you're going to hear me say this over and over and over again, that the defense's job is merely to create doubt in one juror, not even the entire jury, but all they have to do is create doubt. This and what I just read right now is more than enough to create doubt. Now, whether or not, whether or not it actually does create doubt in a juror is a different story, but this is exactly something that a, a defense attorney would absolutely use in order to create doubt. So at one second, you're sitting here and you're thinking about, well, look at the evidence because you look at the affidavit, the probable cause affidavit, basically, and, and it words it as if you just can't deny it. It's solid evidence. You cannot deny it. It's, it was enough for me to go. And it still is. I'm going to be honest. It's enough for me to be like, you know what? That dude is dead to rights, but he's technically not dead to rights, not according to a court of law. Now, according to the public, it is what the hell is he doing? in that area why was he in that area in the first place he's sitting here and he's denying that he has any knowledge he hasn't any knowledge of these people or anything but the cell phone pings his 8545 number the cell phone pings only put him in the general vicinity they don't put him at the scene of the crime that little detail that little bit of of give is enough for a defense attorney to use and tell a jury like, well, okay, it's a public street. A lot of people are around there. How does that put him inside the house murdering four people in cold blood? You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> so this is one of those cases where you and I know that this dude is guilty, everything about it, all of the evidence is enough for us to be like, dude, we know he's guilty. But the way the law works is if, if it's not solid evidence, if it's not, you know, red-handed solid evidence, um, well, no, just call me hen, not necessarily. Uh not necessarily. The DNA does that, doesn't it? Well, the DNA on the button of the knife sheath that's left there. Well, I mean, it, it, it in theory, sure. It's real easy to think that. It's real easy to go, well, yeah, you know, the, they, they, get, they got DNA. DNA doesn't lie. When you're leaning towards that aspect of DNA evidence and you're thinking, 
DNA doesn't lie. DNA doesn't lie. doesn't matter if DNA lies or not, or it doesn't matter that it doesn't lie. It doesn't matter. Even though the DNA doesn't lie, and even though the DNA does belong to Brian Koberger, the circumstances of which the knife sheath are in the house don't necessarily dictate that he committed the murder. Could be that he attended a party at the house and left his knife sheath behind. For all we know. You know what I mean? It's not definitive evidence that he was there during the murders and actually committed the murders. Bottom line, it is not definitive evidence that he committed these murders. So the law is tricky like that. And it, it, it's very possible. And I said this before, people. I said this when I first read the, the probable cause affidavit and I went over everything that they had. Be ready. Be ready. Because he could actually walk. I don't think he will. But this could be another Casey Anthony situation where we know he's guilty, but it doesn't matter what you know. It's what you can prove in a court of law beyond a reasonable doubt. And there's clearly room for reasonable doubt here. So just be ready for that. That's all I'm saying. Now, the white Hyundai Elantra, while there are photos of the car zooming through the Moscow streets in the night of the murder, there's no clear photo of Koberger at the wheel at that evening. Not one single one. The DNA on the knife sheath, snap. It's apparently, now we're going to get into what you were talking about there, Hen. Uh, it's apparently touch DNA. That is, it's, <clears throat> that is, it's derived from a fingerprint rather than a drop of blood. And that's pretty shaky evidence. Often more guesswork than science. The courtroom reality is that in case, in the courtroom reality is that in case after case, touch DNA has been tarnished by a motley collection of false positive results. A smart defense attorney might argue that there's just a much that, that there's just as much likelihood of touch DNAs being uh, being accurate as a juror's winning the lottery. Who'd want to condemn someone to execution based on those odds? That's another thing we have to keep in, into consideration. I'm going to read that last sentence once once again. Well, I'm going to read that last section right there. A smart defense attorney might argue that there's just as much likelihood of touch DNAs being accurate as a juror's winning the lottery. Who'd want to condemn someone to execution based on those odds? You've got to think. A jury is made up of the defendant's peers, okay? And right now, the jury has the kind of pressure where you are... the jury has the kind of pressure where they are basically the fate of this man's life is in their hands. This is a capital punishment state. Idaho is a capital punishment state. So right now this jury is thinking, and even if it's not just execution, even just, just, just the, the, the thought of you and the decisions that you unanimously make with 11 other people, um, all of a sudden comes to, boils down to the fate of this person's life. Whether they end up getting executed or having to spend the rest of their life without the possibility of parole, you're taking their life away if you decide that they're guilty. So that's why I'm always saying I'd never want to be on a jury. I would never, ever, ever want to be on a jury, especially on a case like this, because I, 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 if I have that little bit of doubt, I, I'm going to vote not guilty. You know what I mean? Unless I get solid, solid evidence, I'm going to vote not guilty. I'm not going to vote. Well, mm, it looks bad. So yeah, you know what I mean? This is somebody's life. I'm not going to, I'm not going to have the fate of someone in my hands and take that for granted and just take that lightly. You know, 
Um, so you, you've got to put yourself in the position of these jurors. Uh, this is a very, very scary, scary situation for them. Uh, so like I said, be prepared. You, you know, uh, use that as, as just one factor as to preparing yourself for whatever turns out as a verdict in this case, you know, uh, you have to keep, you, you have to be empathetic of these jurors and, 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 and put yourself in their position for just uh, even just a moment. Now there's the eyewitness identification. Well, a lot of people have bushy eyebrows and the testimony from a witness who is in a frozen shock phase, as she put it, might be problematic uh, at best. And that's without even getting into why she uh, waited seven hours or so before making sure that the police were notified. Uh, the poignant pr truth might very well be that Dylan Mortensen, although she was not physically attacked, was another victim that night and that she's in no shape to take the witness stand and face rapid firing, if not mean-spirited defense counsel. Now, that's another interesting point I wanted to make because everybody wants to throw shade and, uh, and criticize uh, Dylan for not making the 911 call immediately. They want to uh, ostracize her for saying that she um, did not act fast enough uh, and, and she waited seven hours and blah, 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 blah. And um, a defense attorney, um, and this is something that we hadn't really thought of because we thought about how this could how a defense attorney can use uh, social media trashing this person relentlessly. I'm talking about on Twitter. I'm talking about all over YouTube. Everybody tearing this poor girl apart without really understanding where she was coming from, what the circumstances exactly were as to why she didn't call 911 immediately. We just don't understand fully what happened. Now, a defense attorney could easily... Now, this is where it gets bad, and this is where people are, uh, pe these, these, these YouTubers and these people on Twitter don't fully understand how they're interfering with a possible witness. Now, she is, is described in this article as a possible star witness, the key witness. She can identify his eyebrows, right? A lot of people have bushy eyebrows, as it says right here. But then there's the factor of how traumatized she already was in the first place to not have called 911 immediately. That maybe she didn't call 911 immediately because she was traumatized, right? Now, do you think that it's helping the situation that she's being destroyed all over social media for the same exact thing? Do you think that that's going to help the prosecution use her as a witness? Do you, Or do you think it's going to help the narrative of the defense making her not a credible witness because of all of her trauma. When you're further building that trauma, you're further engaging in, 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 in causing more trauma to this poor person. Think about that. So when we're YouTubers and we're people on Twitter, are we people who actually want justice for these victims? Or are we people who just want to uh, be the loudest when it comes to these cases? You know, because now this is just this just explained one example as to how a def how a, how the defense can use the fact that she was too traumatized to call nine one one at the time as discrediting her as a witness because she's too traumatized to actually testify. So if this person is too traumatized to, set, to testify, do you think that dragging her all over social media is, 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 is helping that in any way, shape, or form? Do we want justice for these victims or not? Then there's the murder weapon. Where is it? 
The police have not found the long bladed knife used in the killings. And they have so far not been able to establish that Koberger owns such a weapon. And I have to wonder how uh, conscien conscientiously they are trying. Just a week ago, I walked into Dunkelberger's on Main Street in, Stratos in, in Stroudsburg. It's a sporting goods store that might as well be an armory. There are walls mounted with racks of rifles and display cases lined with gleaming long bladed knives. And it's just about a half hour drive from the uh, Koberger family home in Albrightsville. It's a sort of local shop one might visit if, if one were looking to buy a knife. So I asked the man who identified himself as the manager if the police ever checked the store, uh, if, the, if the police ever checked the store records to see if Brian Koberger had made a, uh, had, had made a purchase. He answered, nope. Pretty surprising, too, now that you mention it. <laughs> now, that's interesting, folks, because this this gentleman, this Howard Blum, who wrote this article. This Howard Blum, who wrote this article, personally went into this store and asked if law enforcement had ever gone in and asked for the sales records. And this guy, the manager of the store, bluntly just says, nope. And here I was on my channel. Because people were questioning, like, I wonder if people actually did that. Did law enforcement actually do that? And I'm thinking, of course they did. I was even loud about it on my channel. I was like, of course they did. Cops are not going to like, you know what I mean? Like, even even, even uh, the chief of police that was that was holding these press conferences was saying, well, we're, we're, we're looking for any possibility of someone purchasing a knife within the area we're looking for anybody who could have used any type of knife um because we believe it was this long bladed knife and uh that's the murder weapon and blah 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 and they believe it could have been military issued at the time we didn't know that they found the sheath but obviously their reason their probable cause for believing that it was this knife uh is because they found the sheath uh laying next to maddie's bed now um here I was going, well, I mean, of course, <laughs> of course they walked into that store and asked to see who bought the knife. And this guy and, and, and the manager is saying, nope, cops never came in asking. Maybe they didn't feel that they needed the murder weapon. Who knows? I don't know. But why law enforcement would not actually go into that store that's only 30 minutes away from uh, the Covert family home. Why, why they would not ask uh, to see the sales records and see if anybody's bought a knife that size recently. Uh, that's beyond me. So. But arguably the most perplexing question that the prosecutors will have to wrestle with if they hope to persuade a jury is why, what was the motive for someone to kill four college students in cold blood? And so far there isn't one. I'm growing increasingly convinced that they will never find one, at least not a motive that's grounded in common sense logic motive as in a reason though that might be another story. And so I find my thoughts being drawn back to the body cam footage that the police shot at the King road house on a Thursday night in late September, less than two months before the murders, three officers were responding to a noise complaint an annoyed neighbor had made. The neighbor certainly had good cause. The house was jumping. There was a, 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 a tumult of blasting music and high-spirited, attractive college kids wandering in and out of the three-story home. Six-packs and empty Truly cans were scattered about. Truly? I don't even know what Truly is. As I watched that video, replaying it again and again and again in the perplexing days that followed, I found myself reflecting on one of wise old William Blake's af aphorisms. Exuberance is beauty. These giddy goings-ons were exuberant. All right. Uh, sorry. These giddy going-ons on, going were exuberant, all right. And in their reckless, heedless, incautious, forever young, Ebulence, 
ebullience. Sorry. Uh, I'm not a writer, folks. Don't have that much of a vocabulary. <laughs> uh, in their forever young ebu e e ebullience, they were beautiful too. Can you imagine looking at that wild night, all the happy uh, fr frivolity from some hideout in the shadows, and at the same time knowing deep in your dark heart that you would never be part of anything that exuberant, that beautiful. It would be hell, a hell of unsatisfied desire that could plunge someone deeper and deeper into a tormenting rage, an envy that would be all-consuming sickness. And in the end, there would be no way out, just the deed. Um, so yeah, and I'm sure as this goes on, uh, there'll be a part three. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this is just going to go on. This series of articles is going to move forward and forward and forward. This Blum person is going to write a part three as the trial begins. Uh, but in the meantime, and I want you to be clear, this just came out today. Um, keep in mind. I'm making a very, very, very keen observation here, folks. And in my very keen observation that I'm making, uh, at no point are you seeing uh, him talk about somebody who cut Brian's hair. Uh, at no point are you talking, are, are you hearing him talk about the, uh, the attorney that represents, uh, that represented Zana Kernogel's uh, uh, Kernodal's uh, mother in her criminal case uh, and now re representing Brian. Um, at no point are you seeing any of this stuff. Uh, um, Terry Dean, the source is, and Emily Flotilla, thank you for the super sticker. Uh, the source is a uh, journalist, a very, uh, Luke, uh, a very uh, reputable journalist named Howard Blum. Uh, let me see if I can find something on him here. Oh, wow. He's, he's an author. He's a published author. Um, Says here, Howard Blum is an American author and journalist, formerly a reporter for the Village Voice and the New York Times. Blum is a contributing editor at Van Vanity Fair and the author of several nonfiction books, including the New York Times bestseller and Edgar Award winner, American Lightning, Terror Mystery, The Birth of Hollywood, and The Crime of the Century. So yeah, this guy knows his stuff. Uh, Becky G, thank you so much. People should not judge others in horrific circumstances if they've never been there. Your pretend morals would fall apart in reality. I completely and totally agree, Becky G. I absolutely 150% agree. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to be following this guy a lot more closely moving forward because I find it very, very interesting uh, that he is putting into detail just basic common sense. Like I was saying, um, he's not uh, he's not pointing out things that is considered dirt or gossip. Um, this is just stuff that is very, very. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh it, 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 the, the, these are things that 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 are that are important to the case itself and, and important to trying to understand Brian Koberger a little bit better. Uh, you know, his Tinder date is not going to give you any reliable insight on his character. Uh, <laughs> um, I just feel as though we should have a, a, a higher standard when it comes to these cases, because. Again, you know, um, 
even though it's an interesting, I guess, fun fact that his uh, that his current uh, attorney is is at one point represented uh, Zana's mom. Uh, but at the same time, it's really not uh, it's really not that interesting <laughs> when you think about it. It's really not that serious. Uh, it's really not that big of a, a of a stretch. It's a small town. Uh, this is the chief uh, prosecutor in that town. You know what I mean? Like they're going to represent a lot of different people. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're they're going to have a lot of different clients. You know, so so it's not so it's not so fascinating to me that they have the same. Um, it's not so fascinating to me that they that they have the same uh, public defender. You know what I mean? I mean, why is that? You know, it's not like this is New York City, you know, where there's five boroughs and and and, and all these different areas. It, it, it's not like that. It's not like it's a major city. This is a small town, a small, tight knit community, a small, tight knit college town. So for us to sit here and 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 and, and go, oh, my God. This is crazy. It's a conflict of interest. No, it's not. Not at all. I'm 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 perfectly confident that this 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 uh, uh sorry, not pot prosecutor, but public defender. I'm per perfectly confident that this public defender can absolutely do their job without any prejudice. Um, I mean, you don't think that some of her past clients. Some of his or her past clients, I don't know if it's a male or a female, but um, some of his or her past clients don't already know each other in such a small town. Is that so hard to believe? But, you know, it's uh, it's it's content. <laughs> oh, my God. Let's do a two hour live on the conflict of interest that doesn't exist. <laughs> Sorry, I know I'm a dick. Um, and I do appreciate you guys joining me today uh, so early. This is definitely not my usual time uh, of going live. Uh, and um, this was provided to me by a very, very good friend of this channel. I'm not even sure if they want to be named. But uh, this article was, was, was provided to me by a very, very good uh, ally of this channel and good friend. And I'm very grateful to them. Um, and, uh, and I do apologize for my, uh, for, for my lack of, uh, vocabulary and my lack of education and, 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 and reading an article. I hope I could do, uh, that article by such a, a insightful and educated man, um, an experienced author and, uh, and, and, and journalist. Uh, I hope I, that I didn't, uh, you know, uh, like I said, I, I realized I was a little, little out out of my league there as far as uh, <laughs> some of the stuff that I was reading and uh, but um, but I appreciate you guys' patience with me and uh, uh, and and you guys got the gist of it so uh, <laughs> um, no yeah and I, I I didn't I couldn't see your comments if you guys were razzing me about my word pronunciation in the chat I didn't even see it anyway because I was too busy focused on reading it. So, um, so it's okay. If you guys were razzing me, I deserve it. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't have the vocabulary of a, of a college educated journalist, uh, and, 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 uh, nonfiction published author. So, uh, <laughs> I do apologize for, uh, for that. If I, if, if I, you know, didn't do it justice, but I did the best I could. And I appreciate you guys, uh, bearing with me. So thanks a lot. Um, and, you know, we can't always do, uh, you know, we can't always make it about BHB and MGL and all that. Uh, you know what I mean? There's uh, at the end of the day, you know, we talk about these cases and we can't honestly criticize um, these other channels who, who, who handle these cases so irresponsibly and, uh, we can't very well criticize them uh, if we don't actually address the facts, if we don't ever actually go over the facts ourselves, um, it would be pretty hypocritical. So uh, before I can call them 
uh, irresponsible YouTubers and not knowing anything and not doing their due diligence and and educating themselves themselves on these cases. Uh, it's fair that we uh, have to educate ourselves first before we can make those kind of accusations towards them. Uh, so once in a while, we're going to just do very serious live streams where we discuss these cases and just go over uh, mere facts uh, or at least facts that are verifiable by a reputable news source. Uh, and I believe that this is a very reputable news source. And I believe this is a very reputable journalist. And he's getting his facts from inside sources within law enforcement that are working this case directly. I do believe that. Uh, and so moving forward, anything that he covers uh, in this case, regarding this case, I'm going to go over on this channel uh, as much as I possibly can. So uh, again, guys, I really, really, really appreciate with all, uh, I, I appreciate all you guys being here and, and, and bearing with, uh, my, uh, my poor reading skills and my dyslexia and all of that stuff <laughs> that plays a factor in, 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 <laughs> and when I'm reading these, uh, these articles or court documents from time to time, again, you know, when I read court documents, I'm not a lawyer, I don't know what a lot of it means. And then we just try to explore them. Uh, explore these things with our uh, very limited educations. Uh, just because uh, we're not attorneys and just because we don't have experience working in the courts, uh, it doesn't mean that we uh, can't try to understand them as best as we can and go over them and try to, uh, um, like I said, try to understand uh, these cases a little bit better. Uh, because nevertheless, these are cases uh, and situations that we are all very equally passionate about and care about, and we want to get to the bottom of them, and we want these victims to get justice. Most importantly, we want these victims to get justice. So, uh, guys, I'm going to wrap this up. Got to go to the gym. Got a lot to do today. I love you guys very, very much, and uh, I hope that you guys have a fantastic day and a fantastic weekend. I might go live again tonight. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, just depends. Uh, either way, I will probably go live tomorrow if I don't go live again tonight. But again, thank you guys for joining me. I love you very much. And we will do this again very soon, my friends.